industry. industry. Inside Analysis is your source of information and insight about how to make the most of this exciting new era. Learn more at InsideAnalysis.com. InsideAnalysis.com. And now, here's your host, Eric Cavanaugh. If you're so Welcome to the future indeed. As uh, my hero, William Gibson, says, the future is here already. It's just not evenly distributed, at least not yet. And that's the purpose of our show is to distribute the future, at least tell you about what's coming down the pike. And I got to say, folks, I have never seen the future come faster than it has been coming in the last few months. So here on our show, of course, we talk all about the information economy, new jobs, new roles, new technologies, new business models, new ways of doing things. And uh, wow, we kind of hit the inflection point, uh, I guess, about five, six months ago. And really, you can peg it to chat GPT as a large language model. It's not new. Large language model has been around for a while, for a couple of years at least. But uh, this particular version came out mature enough and big enough and wild enough to to really shock the business world. I can tell you that uh, people are kind of freaked out. Even the folks at Google are nervous. And of course, they have their own large language model called BARD, which is different than ChatGPT in a number of different ways. But the bottom line is that this form of artificial intelligence, AI, is absolutely shaking the foundation of how we do business. It's not perfect, and it need, it really is important to understand the limitations of these things and, and understand the use cases, when you use them, when not to use them. And there is all this talk of so-called hallucinations. Well, what is a hallucination? Well, for those who don't know yet, uh, ChatGPT, BARD, these large language models, they are basically predictive engines for words, and they will deliver words based upon the prompt you give them. They've been trained on millions and even billions of points and tons and tons, mountains of data. And so they can reflect back in prose all kinds of different concepts. You can use ChatGPT or BARD to write a business plan or to write marketing emails or to write articles or blogs or short stories or all kinds of stuff. But it is generative in nature, which means it creates new stuff. And basically the way it works is it fuses together vectors of information based upon its model, its training, and also your prompts, what you give it. Well, very quickly in this new world, we started seeing people talk about embeddings and trying to figure out ways to get these engines to be more accurate in specific domains of of content. So in banking or in healthcare or in retail or marketing or whatever, embeddings refer to actual real corporate data that you either embed into the model itself, which is kind of complicated, or most people are talking about embedding them in a vector database, which is then adjacent to the large language model. And what happens is when you give your prompt, the engine will reach into both areas. It'll reach into your vector database to see your trusted data, and then it'll reach over into its corpus of language and understanding to kind of fuse together some content that is reflective then of your corporate data. This is called training the models. And uh, you do have to train these things for them to be very good at what you want them to be good at, but they are very good right out of the box at all kinds of stuff. But what's fun from my perspective is that when we start talking about pointing these algorithms at your corporate data, well, you have to be careful about that because a lot of companies really don't know everything that they have in terms of data. And historically, it's been very difficult to figure that out because what would you do? And they just run some query and you know just run a report. Okay, here's our data. It's a very difficult thing to uh, to break down, to parse, and to demonstrate. And frankly, it's just hard to crawl across all those objects, all those documents in your SharePoint instance or wherever else you have information stored. So it's important to remember that for basically every organization of any significant size or age, you're going to have a ton of data in the form of spreadsheets, in the form of, uh, of PDFs and Word documents and all kinds of different things. So you're going to have all this information that can be very useful, but there may be sensitive information and then there may be wrong information too. So this training is really important stuff. And we're going to talk to a company today that can help you figure out if you're at the starting line. Now, this is not all that they do, 
But when I was talking to them about their uh, technology and their services, I thought to myself, hey, you guys have a really powerful story to tell in this whole large language model narrative that is unfolding right now. And so to that end, we've got Lewis Wynn Jones on the line from Think Data Works. And of course, we have our buddy Eve Mulkers in the wings. He'll be joining us in a second. But Lewis, tell us a bit about yourself and Think Data Works and how you are able to help companies determine if they're ready for large language models and then kind of go down that road. Thanks so much, Eric. And, and thanks for the sort of primer. I think that you, you hit the nail on the head. There's uh, so much excitement right now. And a lot of that has been because of what ChatGPT has done in the past few months. Um, my company, is, as you sort of suggested, is, is more in the sort of data management space. And, and that's definitely a less sexy place than uh, than what you're sort of seeing when you when you plug a prompt into ChatGPT and see what comes out. But the reality is, if you scratch really hard at the surface, um, you start to realize that you do need to have well-structured data in order to get well-structured responses coming out the other end. I think that what we see with ChatGPT is the generalization of large language model and generative AI tech, which is why it's so exciting, right? The fact that there's uh, something out there that I can go and I can plug a question into and get a pretty good response back. That's really exciting. But the reason it's exciting for me is because I haven't been working in AI for the past you know, 10 years trying to build these models. And the fact that my grandmother can go and do this is, is really sort of the exciting part of this. Um, I think that if you want to start to have that tech embedded into the internal systems of most companies, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to get you to that place. And the things that get you to that place are management of your data assets. I mean, you kind of mentioned it. Um, most people have data all over the place. They don't, they've got a better inventory of their office furniture than they do of their data sets. Um, <laughs> and there's a lot of um, things that are required to make good on the promise of AI and actually uh, start to generate value at the back end of your business. Um, and so that's really where, where our company sits. Uh, I'm the VP of product here, and we've been building um, a, a data platform for the past roughly 10 years. Um, we were born out of the open data space, actually, which, uh, it, you know, for those of people who are listening who don't remember what that was all about, but it was governments that were sort of giving data into the public domain and saying this could be valuable. The problem with it was that it was all over the place. It was a mess. Of, there was no standardization and, uh, you know, it was file formats from the 1970s. So what we did is we would sort of sit on top of all this data, standardize it, make it accessible to people. And that's when we really realized that the thing that was happening with open data globally was also happening within the enterprise itself. Like the data is all over the place. It's a mess. It's uh, you know, you don't know how to get the value out of it. And so the tool that we built to sort of standardize all this government data, we we sort of turned towards business data and uh, and all of the tool and functional functionality that go along with that, which really does support it's sort of that data refinery in order to get the uh, the AI analysis coming out the other end of it. So it's I would say that it's a prerequisite to start to get the benefit of large language models or any other kind of AI modeling that that you require. Yeah, and, and I think your background and kind of where you all came from is perfectly suited for this challenge because you were out there trying to reconcile, classify, and organize this vast amount of data, unstructured data, all kind of different formats, very unwieldy. So that was your, you know, kind of how you cut your teeth on that environment. And now you're able to do the same thing and help organizations, again, understand what they have which for those who haven't tried, I promise is a very difficult and challenging task to undertake, but it's very important for lots of reasons. I mean, I kind of think that this is the sort of come to Jesus moment, if you will, for enterprises and all the data they've been sweeping under the rug for the last 30 years. It's like, we've known that we had to do something about it, but now you really, really do have to do something about it. And, uh, and you guys can help with that process, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that the, it really depends who you're talking to, because it, it, it in certain boardrooms, people are saying, well, we want streamlined analytics, we want to make data driven decisions, we want all this stuff. And they don't understand that in order to get there, you need to have your house in order. Um, and it, and you, it's a step that you can't actually skip that sort of data operation step the metadata management step, the good indexing, the good tagging, and the secure distribution throughout the enterprise is not a nice to have. It is a prerequisite. And what we're seeing across the enterprise is that people who have skipped that step and maybe set up very good data and analytics divisions who are trying to 
you know, unleash the power of AI on the enterprise, what they're doing is they're generally sort of building one or two products a year. Um, this is not fully automated, and this is not actually uh, a system that is going to scale well. It's a system that under the hood, if you scratch it, like if you get underneath it, it's a lot of ad hoc work. And what everyone wants to do to really maximize the benefit of this stuff is to automate those processes. And the way to automate them is to have your data environment set up in a way that will facilitate sort of the pulling in of data, the pushing back, the sharing, the, the sort of collaboration and the management of that data. Otherwise, what you're going to be doing is basically manually curating data sets and pushing them in, into Tableau. And that is not AI as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> That's uh, I hear Eve laughing there. I'll I'll uh, bring you in to comment on that. I mean, I think Lewis just hit the nail on the head there. You really want to be strategic about this process, and it can be extremely valuable going through the inventory to understand where you've come up from and what's happening. Right? Go ahead, Eve. Yeah, uh, what I see, I, I think back of my years of of doing software development, and and this this is what we see now in data management, maturing it. Uh, back in the days, you wrote a piece of code uh, as such, and then some libraries came along. You started using those libraries to be more proficient and more productive in creating your applications and your software. And this is now happening with all the libraries. For example, if you take Python that are available to access APIs, to access uh, large language models. Uh, but still, like you say, uh, Louis, it's... it's you take these things, you take one product, you build one product, but people don't think about the architecture to be capable of really scaling the products. And that's something where I see that is a, sometimes a, a misconnect between more technical people, uh, especially in the IT uh, department, compared to business people, where they see the, 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 the magic shining object and they think, well, it's like you say in Tableau, bam, we've got our dashboard. Yeah, next time something changes, how fast are, we gonna, are you going to change the, the dashboard? How much effort will it take you? Do you understand where your data comes from? And that is what, when we talk about architecture, that you need to put these really solid foundations in place to be able to manage it. And that's very oftentimes forgotten. So I'm quite happy that I've seen it through my career as well. Uh, these are the things we've been building over the time. And now all of a sudden it gets attention. It gets a name. Like for example, if you talk about observability, well, we need to know where the data comes from. Yes, we've been interrogating the metadata over time into our systems to understand how it looks like to automate it, to uh, deploy it in a continuous way. Uh, look at software development as well, uh, where now we have continuous integration and continuous development where this was not possible 20, 30 years ago. And I see that happening now with, with, especially with the large language models and all the AI tools that we are definitely looking at that. So once we've get this really into a continuous development mode, um, we're off the hook. I think uh, it's gonna be even more amazing and the speed is going, going to increase even more than we saw over the last uh, few months with, uh, with the large language models. Yeah, and uh, you know, I'll bring Lewis back in to comment on something in particular. You mentioned architecture, and Lewis, that's really important, right? What Eves is talking about here is building an information foundation that will allow you to then build apps more quickly, as opposed to just building one-off bespoke apps, which may solve a business problem for now, but will not scale very well and won't be optimal in terms of allowing you to do other apps that use the same data, for example, we're talking about data products here, right? And so if you build the foundation well, then the individual products can be spun up pretty quickly and efficiently. Whereas if you don't, if it's all bespoke and spaghetti wires going in between them, again, it may solve a particular problem, but it's not going to last for too long and it will amount to technical debt before long, right? Yeah. And I mean, the thing is, is this isn't theory. This is practice. We've seen this happen before, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, people said, oh, if you dump all your data into a data lake, magic stuff is going to come out of it. Well, what happened there? We got a bunch of really, really messy data environments and people still struggling with this problem. And then said, people said, okay, well, the cloud will be the solution to all these problems. Well, okay. People started to centralize to the cloud and now we're, they're going back to having a more sort of on-prem and hybrid environment. People are looking for the magic bullet. The thing that's going to sit on top of an unstructured environment and magically pull insights out. That's not what's going to happen. And AI can never get there because it needs to be trained in a well-architected environment, in a, in a good sort of 
well-balanced place where data flows evenly. Um, and that I'm not saying that the, the previous technologies that have come out from cloud to data lakes have been mistakes. They haven't. They've been extremely useful and they've taken us sort of forward. But I think now what we're looking at is you don't want to have to centralize everything into one place for a bunch of reasons, um, but you also can't have everything existing in you know random regions everywhere. So really what we're seeing, and this is just from an architecture perspective, is a new sort of reliance and focus on data virtualization. So you can actually connect the data wherever it is um, and, and you are centralizing access without actually centralizing assets themselves. And that's the sort of thing that you can do to really start to um, create this central uh, observation platform for the data. Um, and that's going to be the key to unlock management and distribution within the enterprise. And then, of course, yes, all the downstream benefits of connecting to it to your analytical tools and, if you need to, your models that you're going to be building at the back end. But without it, you're just sort of trying to build on, on pretty murky, uh, swampy ground. Yeah, no, that's a really, really good point where you're democratizing access through a governed zone, if you will. Because and we've talked about this for years now on this show and other shows, too, that something like data governance cannot happen if you have 18 to 200 entry points where you're only managing five to seven of them. Well, then you don't have governance. Now, historically, getting to that point was extremely difficult because the technology really wasn't up to snuff. If you tried to go through that one choke point, things just wouldn't work fast enough. But I think we have seen the capability to expand out, to scale out dynamically and be able to handle those things real quick. I think Lewis, we are at the beginning of another era because we now can pull that off efficiently and effectively, whereas, you know, five, 10 years ago, it wasn't really that possible. What do you think? Yeah, no, I think you're 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 right. Governance um, matured faster than the technology, um, and so the principles of governance were saying, okay, you need to do this, this, and this. And so people were writing extremely robust data privacy programs, but they couldn't actually implement them with the tech that existed. Now that tech does exist, and I think that the kind of uh, egalitarian approach to distribution within the enterprise and good governance are possible at the same time. So you can get increased access and increased governance at the same time, which before it was, I think, one or the other. Yeah, that's a really good point, too, because you did have to make a choice before now. You don't have to make that choice. There are other choices you'll need to make, of course, but you can pull this off. And it, you know, if governance is important to you and it's important to most organizations, not just for security, but also for quality, you know, for quality product out the other side, you know, you want to have some governance so you know what's going into this, you know how to manage it. And we're getting there, folks. We're getting there. Well, don't touch that dial. I'll be right back. We're talking to a couple experts here on Inside Analysis. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Inside Analysis. Here's your host, Eric Cavanaugh. Take us to the future. All right, folks. Welcome back once again to Inside Analysis. Take us to the future indeed. Your host, Eric Cavanaugh, here with Eve Mulkers and Lewis Wynn Jones. We'll be talking about the power of AI and are you ready for it in your organization? I've been joking that uh, my router may not be ready for the power of AI because it keeps crapping out on me. That's not very good. I have to call Armstrong Cable after this show and uh, read them the right act. But uh, in the meantime, let's get back to our guests. And we were just talking about how the data management side really is so crucial. And uh, I'll throw this over to you first. Lewis, you know, data management has always been important. Data quality, understanding your processes, your workflows, all that stuff, what you have, where it came from, lineage, et cetera. And it's even more important now in the age of AI because these engines are very powerful and they will take whatever you give them and create something from that. And if what you're giving them is bad data, you're going to get very bad results, right? Go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I mean, I think that talking about the results, uh, the thing that's kind of happening right now is that the people who are in charge of data management historically have been kind of the IT side of the organization, um, whereas the people who are in charge of the results, you know, the data products and those things, were more business. Um, and what's happened over the past 10 years, 15 years, is those two sides of the business have grown further and further apart. Um, what we need to do, both like just sort of culturally, but also through infrastructure, is to bring those two sides of the business back together again, right? You need to have data management intimately tied to data productization and building AI and things like that. Because 
Alternatively, what you have, if you don't do that, is the business side of the organization talking about AI and all of its potential to transform business, and the IT side of the organization stuck in sort of data governance land. And you need to start bringing those two things together to sort of create a cohesive umbrella of data and analytics together, um, which are governed by single tools that are you know, applicable to business users and IT users in equal measure. And that's, I think that that's something that ChatGPT has actually done really, really well is made this something that can be used by anyone. Yeah. And, you know, let me just kind of chime in here and say that, uh, you know, the, there are lots of different values that you can get from data virtualization. One of which is just knowing which data is most important. I'll throw it over to, to uh, Lewis first, but if you have a good data virtualization solution, you're going to be seeing in very clear fashion what data is being used, what data is important. That can help you then architect the rest of your data foundation, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, a data virtualization is one of those things that I think is is close to that silver bullet that, that people have been looking for, because what it allows you to do is instead of getting tied up into this ETL land where you're constantly having to move things from here and there, you're just projecting it from where it lives um, mm -hmm. into a centralized place and creating that sort of possibility for someone who maybe doesn't have access to your SQL server to go see the data that's in it without it moving, without it breaking any of your governance rules. And that's why virtualization is a, a tool within a sort of larger data management framework that's really, really powerful to just provide that democratic access piece. Now, of course, you want some layers of control on top of that about how you actually distribute the data, but just having the ability to project uh, or create a lens through to the data from where it resides into another location that is more user accessible is incredibly powerful technology. And then the next piece of that, of course, is once you've got access to that, that piece of data, that, that virtualized data, being able to then connect it to your downstream analytics from that same centralized place, right? Because if you can't finish off that storyline, then you've just sort of check the book out from the library, but you can't open it, right? It's not useful for you. So you need to have that end-to-end -end integrated setup. And, and Eve earlier was talking about the architecture needs to be right there. And the problem is if you try to do this with seven different discrete pieces of functionality, they all need to play nice with each other, right? And what mm -hmm. our approach has always been is that you need to have to be able to do all of these things from a single system that can virtualize the data, make it discoverable, and then push it down where it needs to go. Um, if you try to break that apart too far, it's going to get, you're going to get in the weeds again. Yeah. Well, and there is this question of scale. I think, Eve, that's what's really shaking a lot of businesses right now is that the scale of data that's available that needs to be processed to get some signal for AI is so much larger than it was five years ago, 10 years ago, and old systems are just going to break. They're just not going to be able to suffice. And so we're in this sort of transformative period of time now where organizations have to be very strategic and figure out what is my stepping stone to the next generation of technologies. And I think that's where data virtualization is extremely compelling because, again, you use it as this, this pathway, a bridge to get to the next way of doing things that still is connected to your existing environment because, you, you know, rip and replace is always very, very difficult. Uh, so difficult that it almost never happens. Right? I mean, we've joked before about sunsetting applications and other fantasies, right, or other fairy tales. So it's difficult to do. So that data virtualization is a really powerful mechanism to solve these problems and open the door to the next generation of how to do things. What do you think, Eve? Yeah, we've been discussing about that, and and what I see in, in a virtualization uh, layer, and which is not so understandable for the most of the people, is it's. It simplifies or uh, it's abstraction of the integration behind the scenes as such. If you back in the days, uh, they've been build, building point to point systems. So you had to integrate each system with each and, and every other system within the organization. That takes a lot of time. If something changes on one end, you need to change all the interacting systems. With virtualization, this is kind of glue what you put on top of that. If you think about object oriented programming, you had your classes and it was a kind of abstraction layer what you had to which you were talking to the other systems compare it to an API in such a way. This is where integration solves, where, where virtualization solves a part of the integration pr problem as such, but at this other end as well, uh, allows you to scale your systems because it's composable. You can change your database behind the scenes or depending on which 
type of query you want to run, is it more analytical or more operational wise, you can talk to do different systems, but it looks like one and the same system if you're a user using the virtualization layer. And that helps into going much faster in building applications and systems uh, on top of a virtualization layer. So for the future as well, you're kind of safe because you developed everything on the simplification layer. And if you need a more performance system, you simply, let's call it still simply, plug it in, uh, in the other system that is more performant, more scalable as such. Uh, if we now see at the cloud, if you need the cloud, you can switch it off to the cloud and make it more scalable and move back to on-prem. So that will simplify your IT landscape in such a way. Uh, but my feeling is that we're still pretty far off on the virtualization uh, level. A lot of organizations are still very reluctant uh, towards virtualization because they had bad uh, experiences in the day where it was not uh, performant. It was pretty expensive. But if you see now the, the virtualization landscape uh, to, together with some semantic layers, uh, this is the time to really look into that and consider that if you're building modern data applications. Mm -hmm. You know, and the, a lot of terms get thrown around like data lake house and data lake and data warehouse. And of course, a very popular term has been data fabric over the last number of years. And when I think about the functionality that a data fabric should have, well, what does it boil down to? It boils down to access, um, governance. It boils down to automation where automation makes sense. And I think that's the ultimate data fabric that has the automation built into it to know when things are happening and to go and grab data sort of before it's needed or before it's going to be needed, that kind of thing. It seems to me that virtualization, if it gets robust enough, can fulfill that role of a data fabric. But I don't know. What do you think, Lewis? Am I splitting hairs or uh, conflating things? No, I mean, I think that that's, I think that that's a fair point. I, I think we're still going to see where we land with the whole data fabric, data lake house, the new nomenclature um, mm -hmm. bit. I, I, I'd put my money right now on data fabric being, uh, being the one that sort of emerges triumphant um, because I think it's very realistic uh, in terms of what is possible. Um, access, discovery, governance, observability, are all made possible by having uh, data virtualization and a data catalog blended together. Um, mm -hmm. you, you throw in some data ops and, and some health monitoring there, and you've got a pretty slick end-to-end -end, um, you know, platform. And then the final key, I think, is that actually at the end of the day, being able to access that underlying data becomes really, really critical. And this is, Eve mentioned, you know, some people have been bitten before with, with sort of virtualization tools and things like that. I think that that was based on a sort of system where um, just cataloging the data was enough. <laughs> um, but at the end of the day, you still need to be able to provide access to that data and need to push it down to where it needs to go in order to provide benefit to the organization. And these are the types of things that we've learned over the past decade that now we're getting right. Um, and uh, and yeah, I think that Fabric is really the solution to that. I think the next step is sort of also getting a solution that enables you to distribute your data more holistically throughout the enterprise and in a secure way um, to really enable that democratization among business and technical units. Yeah, that's a really good point. Even maybe I'll throw it over to you for, for commentary. Again, these are fairly loose terms, but data fabric, I think, does boil down to the access layer that you want your apps to, to connect to, because at the end of the day, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about applications that are going to connect the data that they need to get something done. So instead of the old fashioned process of just persisting data in MongoDB or MySQL or whatever, that's a very linear sort of limited approach. And instead you want this richer environment that any number of apps can tap into and quickly get what they want and get more than they would have gotten from just a single connection to a single database, right Eve? Yeah, the most important part is here that the centralized or the central available governance, what you can tie to your data products uh, in such a way, and that you either consume it through an application, operational application, an API, or you just do an export, you always have that same type of approach on who can access which data. Before it was only within the organization and we see more and more organizations exchanging it with external organizations. So there is the important part that you have an easy way of onboarding your external parties and decide who can see what type of data in an easy way that you can govern them that data. 
where is it going to, who is using it for what, so you stay compliant and know where your data is going there. Especially in marketing, you want to know who are your consumers and who is using, using your data. Especially in Europe, we're pretty strict on, on, on understanding where that data is being used for, for privacy reasons. And I think in that direction, data fabric is, is definitely a, a very nice architecture to support um, governance in a pretty easy way, easy in such a way. It's not out of the blue. It's not snapping with your fingers, but the tools are there and learned a lot from the past where you said in the beginning, it was purely cataloging your data, understanding where it is and who maybe has access to that. But access was mostly a, a very IT related uh, thing in place, very technical, pretty complex. So getting your user account to have access to systems that took months uh, in some some organizations. So this is, is definitely not uh, something if you want to put a product uh, into the market in the next coming month. Yeah, no, these are all really good points. And you know, before the break comes up here, I do want to dive a bit deeper into the discovery side of the equation because you know we're talking again about how to get ready for leveraging a large language model, and that means you got to do some discovery and understand what's out there, where is there personally identifiable information, what is the nature of this business information that we have, and create some sort of a topology or a map to better understand, and then you create your short list of things to work on, of securing this data, or do we really need that data, but it really does start with that discovery process, right, Lewis? What do you think? Yeah, I think you're 100% right. Discovery is sort of the pillar uh, here. And uh, again, it's not the thing that's going to turn heads in the boardroom, uh, you know, being able to discover things. But at the end of the day, um, any sort of catalog or management solution is going to need to index everything to do with your data. And it's going to need to automate that, that indexing process and then allow you to create um, sort of combinations of terms. And those terms might be based on what's in the data, but it might also be based on where does the data live? Uh, who's the owner of the data and my team? You know, For some of our users, it's like, what's the data cost and when's the contract term coming up? These are the things that I actually need to know. And that's metadata that's not just about the, you know, the structural build of the data or its descriptive elements. That's also sort of the uh, administrative side of metadata, all of which needs to be captured by the solution, indexed by the search. And then it can't just be a blinking cursor, you know, Google type search that where you, you plug in, uh, you know, personally identifiable information and automatically everything comes back. You want to be able to create sort of rich combinations of things to get to what you're looking for so that you can create these very highly curated lists. Um, and then once you've done that, you need to sort of have recourse to, to move data around if you need to. We talked a little bit about the expense that's that's uh, driving a lot of this stuff. And you should be able to do hot and cold storage from this platform, move it from a really performant warehouse to a sort of more open source one based on how much it's being used and things like that. That, that all starts with discovery. All those benefits start from being able to just open the door and see what's going on in your uh, environment. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And you know, you talked about the importance of metadata, and I love the comment you made about contracts and data, and what is this costing me, and what value are we getting? You know, when you when you bring together the power of observability with the power of discovery and analysis, and of course the human brain. Let's not forget <laughs> us humans. I don't care what it says; we're going to be around for a while now, and we'll be very important in this space. When you bring all that together, it starts to get very interesting in things like ROI and TCO, which historically have been almost impossible to to really quantify i mean you can tell a story and you can get people excited about stuff that's one way to keep investment in your projects but we're getting so much better now at being able to determine the the value of this particular solution against a key metrics, for example, customer service improved by 30% because the tickets came down, stuff like that. We're getting into a space where it's very measurable and that is very good news for this business. We'll be right back. You're listening to Inside Analysis. Welcome back to Inside Analysis. Here's your host, Eric Cavanaugh. Folks, back here on Inside Analysis, talking to Lewis Wynn Jones from Think Data Works and Eve Mulkers from 7W Data. And uh, in the break, there we were chatting about the power of AI and the, the importance of data discovery. And I keep thinking to myself that these foundational models, which is not just the large language models, but these foundational models, 
are going to fundamentally change a lot of different things. And if you think about how systems talk to each other on the average day, just transacting the work that needs to get done over the network, for example, there are so many efficiencies that we can gain from collaboration, from being able to see what other people are doing. I'm talking to a company right now, in fact, writing a paper in my head for a company called DevRev, which has built this really interesting object model and they're really fusing development with revenue management and isn't that what everyone wants and through their system you can see across roles and see exactly who's working on what at any given time and because they thought through that metadata side of the equation ahead of time i'll throw this over to lewis what you're able to see is not just what all your individual developers are working on, but what kinds of projects are they? Are they maintenance projects? Are they net new functionality projects? And then where is the value? You'll be able to track, oh, well, this project that we launched two months ago is already generating some value. So you can actually start seeing ROI. And to me, that's going to be the key is seeing across organizations who's working on what how, not just up down but sideways and once you can see up down left and right and really understand how your teams are coming together that's a pretty compelling storyline and that comes from discovery but it comes from data management it comes from setting up your models efficiently such that people can see around and understand what's going on but lewis i'll throw it over to you i think that's going to be a, a real push forward in terms of productivity gains just the observability across workloads, across teams. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, you mentioned the, the critical word there, which is observability. And I think that a pound of observability is is going to be, or a, a dash of observability is going to be worth a pound of cure or whatever it is. Um, right. uh, and the, the point here being that teams have always been building interesting things, right? You've got data teams, you've got data scientists who are doing great stuff, but they might be doing it in a vacuum. And I think that when I speak to our clients and the people who use our platform, there's often some person who might be in charge of governance, might be in charge of ROI, who's having to knock on a lot of doors and email a lot of people saying, hey, can you give me an update on what you're working on? Uh, what data sets are you using? What's going on here? That they can still do their thing. I think the model shouldn't be to that you need to completely upend the good work that your teams are doing um, and force them all into a central place. The model should be that if you can have something that can sit on top of all the work that all of your different teams are doing, slurp up that information and then make it more generally accessible to people without upending the work that's already being done, then you're letting someone with, from your team who's in charge of establishing things like ROI or making good connections, right? Saying, oh, this team's working on this data set, this team's working on this data set. If I sort of uh, play a bit of matchmaker between them, maybe they can both run a bit faster. That's the real net benefit here. It's not in improving individual teams, although they will get that benefit as well. It's about sort of across the enterprise, having that sort of democratized view and observation platform and what you get, the the benefit that you get from from that. Yeah, knowing how teams can work together. I mean, this I'll throw this over to Eve. AI can help with these things. I think AI is going to be very compelling for just suggesting things to people, pointing out stuff that maybe you hadn't thought of, because you'll never think of everything. You know, there was a great quote in uh, a movie with William Hurt like 30 years ago. I'll never forget this. One of the characters says something like, you know, they were criminals. And then one guy said, hey, man, you told me there's 100 ways to screw up any crime. If you could think of 50 of them, you're a genius, right? So point being, you're always going to miss something. And that's where AI comes in to help. But to me, again, the power of the human mind, just thinking through things and processing and figuring out what Lewis just referred to, hey, these teams are working on something pretty darn similar. If I can just get them to connect and start sharing information, sharing metadata, sharing plans, roadmaps, I mean, just knowing what people are working on is really compelling and just and team size, right? If you have 100 developers, that doesn't mean you're a accomplishing 100 times as much as one developer, or even 50 times as much as two. It really depends on how well those teams work together, what the plan is, how that plan fits in with what other people are doing. I mean, this is the strategy side of development. And I think all of that is enabled by these large language models or by these, these um, foundational models and the AI, and of course, the data management and the virtualization. But Lewis, I'll throw that first over to you and then over to Eve to comment on. Go ahead. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that that's that's the key is if we want to make good on on anything to do with AI, you can't be uh, have a bunch of developers in closed rooms trying to figure this stuff out on their own. Um, it, it needs to be an open door policy and there needs to be governance attached to it, right? We're not in the Wild West anymore. You can't just say we're going to throw a large language model over our entire database because there's PII in there. There's stuff in there that you don't want it to be trained on. So you need to have governance, which for a lot of people has been a big, hairy problem because they don't know how to do it. And so they've just said, well, our version of governance is no one gets access to anything. We've solved that problem now. That's not the way we're going to you know, move right. forward, right? More people need access to more data um, and in a secure way. So that observation platform and letting it be mission control for data teams, right? So the mm -hmm. person who's tasked with revenue gets to do revenue-based stuff. And the person who's tasked with doing data stuff still gets to do their data stuff. And they get to do it in a quicker, faster, more integrated way. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Eve, you want to comment on that? Yeah, the quicker and faster way, I think, to insights, and that's an important thing uh, that you were discussing just before. It's it's an easy way of looking at uh, 100 tasks or even 1,000 tasks. We see that in, in medical care as well, where the scale really helps you build those insights and give the insights at the, at a hyper speed. And I think that's that's the power what we're seeing, and and sometimes missing these interactions and communication lines within organizations. If you don't talk to the person, you don't get these insights. It's by accident if you're around a water cooler that you have these type of discussions. I say, hey, this 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 is interesting what you're working on. Let's have a look and see if we can do something together. And with the large language models, you get these these uh, advices in, in such a way. On the other hand, as well, where it, it gives you a pretty complete list and you say, throw in another five points and you get the other five points. And after a while, you understand, OK, we really exhausted the model. This is all we can get from it. But that's much harder from a human mind to get all of these aspects listed in, in such a way. So I think that the scale and the speed, that's the important thing where we see that, that it can augment on how we work. Like Eric was saying, thinking through the critical thinking, which is not yet in the models. I think we will see that in the future that the models would evolve and get more critical thinking as well. But this is still a very strong capability what we have as a human being. Yeah. And, you know, I'll get back to the, the theme of the show here, which is using these technologies to discover what data you have, to classify it, to organize it, to understand it. And then maybe you're ready to leverage some of these large language models. But I, I am pretty excited, Lewis, to think about what you could learn about your business by connecting and, and understand that you can possibly remediate so you can publish something in a vector database and go, oh, we shouldn't have done that. Let's pull that out now to not have that exposed. But I have to think that these language models are a very profound mirror that you can use to reflect back what your business has been doing because you will see stuff in there and it's almost like you want if you're a big enough organization you want to have a skunk works team or you know someone who's just in there poking around seeing what's going on to be able to develop your plan to govern and access and virtualize better what do you think lewis I think that's, that's that's a great point. Uh, I would, if I was in charge of a large enterprise, the way I'd be looking at LLMs right now is, let's use this internally to understand a few things internally before we even think about building right. data products with it. Um, right. I think that the problem that I have with generative AI right now is the generative part. <laughs> I, I think I'd like to use it for classification, um, train it on very good models and things like that, but immediately dropping it in and thinking that some uh, production ready tool is going to come out the other end of it, I think is dangerous thinking. And I don't think that this limits the use for the enterprise of, of starting to integrate it, to, to bring in and do some automatic sort of classifications of things. And chatbots are a great use for it. Um, but let's not kid ourselves. Like this is still a pretty nascent technology and, and things like large scale statistical analysis have been around for a long time and people haven't necessarily made good on those either. Why? Because the management problem is still sort of very, very at the core of this issue. So I, I think ChatGPT, the biggest thing that it's done is it's shown that uh, business Business-focused people need to be able to integrate with data in meaningful ways, and they did a really good job of making that possible for us, but we've still got a lot of work to do um, in order to make sure that everyone can benefit from it equally. Yeah, well, there's a lot of education and, gui and guiding, basically guidance provided to organizations to understand how to use it. It's like any tool. You, know, you want to be playing around with it to understand the contours, basically to understand what it does. We do have a show coming up on Thursday. As a matter of fact, Eve will be delivering a keynote on Master of the Prompt. 
He'll uh, give you some advice on how to, to leverage that prompt because it is very important how you phrase those prompts and which specific words you use and, and how you deliver the information to the large language model. And it's just taking time. It's going to take time to, to see what comes back at you and learn how to fine tune these things. And remember, you can regenerate. They all have this capacity to regenerate. So it's like, ah, I didn't like that one. Let's do it again. Add a couple more keywords. Do it again. See what comes out. It'll get you 80% of the way there. Then you have to get yourself the last 20%. But uh, folks, you are listening to Inside Analysis.